tonight, Ojai Film Festival. Um, such an honor to have everyone here tonight and uh, giving your time and attention to this, this film about the Thomas Fire, which happened uh, five years ago now, wow. just about. So um, it's a good time to watch this and reflect about it and, and what we've learned since then. And it's also, given that there's uh, some rain coming tomorrow and this week, you know, we don't have to be sort of holding our breaths that this could happen again, you know, in the next few weeks. So we can just sort of, you know, uh, digest this film. Yeah, FYI, as most of you know, it's pretty intense subject matter. Um, and so just uh, feel free to lean into that and, and don't be self-conscious about it or anything. But it is an intense film um, about an intense time for the Valley and for a lot of the people in here. So it's 38 minutes. And then after, we'll do a little panel with some uh, principals who are really, really... Um, seminal in making the film, and I'm honored to have them here. I'll introduce them after. Um, and then we'll take questions, we'll talk about it. Um, so, 38 minutes, buckle up, uh, enjoy. <laughs> um, thank you everybody for the time, obviously, being here with us. And um, I haven't seen that film. You spent years making something, and you don't watch it for a while. But yeah. comes pouring back um, but so thank you for being here with us tonight let me uh, introduce everybody on our amazing panel this is my boss Noemi Dumont Milano producer editor cinematographer uh, my wife the mother of, no of Mahe there um, and of course you recognize her for the film and, and we run a little production company together um, so she's my partner um, our next amazing guest we're honored to have is Diana Luboff who you saw in the film. Yeah. Um, it was really important for us to have someone here to represent the people who lost their homes. Um, and Mrs. Luboff and her husband, Mr. Luboff there, did. And I mean, they can speak to it better than I, and we can get into that, but we're really honored to have you here. Um, we have Mrs. Julie Tumame Stensley. Huge honor for us to have her here tonight, and even more so to be in our film. And as an associate producer on the project, um, it really, uh, when Julie came into the project, it really took it to the next level in terms of our local legitimacy, our national legitimacy, and it was so important for us to have um, that indigenous representation. And I think some of the most important lines in the film come from Julie, so I can't ever thank you enough for uh, being a part of this project. We have Peter Deneen here, and uh, Pete's in the film, briefly. Pete's one of my best friends, you know, and uh, Pete's in the film and that bear scene, um, which is so visceral. And what happened with the bear? The bear didn't make it. He was put down later that day. But so this film has been released worldwide and people comment on that bear scene. Yes. Everyone who watches the film, everyone, mm -hmm. that's the scene yeah. that comes up first. Yeah. Um, but anyways, Pete was up there, you know, when we filmed that and it's his arm that reaches in and feeds the bear. And also Peter, um, the reason I really wanted to have uh, Peter here tonight, he's an outstanding climate reporter. Um, he's had some of the best coverage on the recent fires and even really recently up here, there was a, a brush fire, a, a fire up in uh, Rose Falls and Pete wrote a great piece for the Ojai Valley News, which I'm sure is gonna get more exposure on the response to that fire. So it was really important for me to have Pete here as a reporter um, because it's five years later now. Um, Pete's covering the issue and he can probably speak to those conversations, what's happening now, um, better than I can. So, so I'm really honored to have Pete here and all the members of our panel. Um, so we'll just open this up to questions really quick. I, um, I'll say this, every film is such, I mean, I, I talk about now, you know, films are, it's so hard to make a film. You know, it takes all of your being, being and you have to sort of enlist a community to make the film. And that was so especially true and special in this film, you know, that it, it really took the community to make this. And so much of the material that is in that film wasn't shot by me. It was shot by one of the hundreds of filmmakers that live in Ojai, you know. And, and after this, everybody was making their Thomas Fire film. Um, and it was really a pleasure and an honor to get to know all those different artists and filmmakers and ultimately be the one like, give me your footage so we can make sort of the definitive statement on it. Um, so what I'm trying to say is this film was really a product of the community um, and as someone who didn't grow up here that was really really important you know um, 
So that's sort of my headline I'm making. Now that, I mean, there's so much to unpack when this is a making of panel. And uh, both of my films, this one and our other film about the police, they're such sort of tour de forces in a way that people can really, after you, you take a big breath and you can really only digest sort of the subject matter, you know, this was so big emotionally. But there's also, I watch it, I'm sitting out there watching it, and there's so much also happening in the making, the technical making of the film, you know, whether it's the music, the edit, how we're piecing together the interviews, and as I sit here and watch it, all of that is coming fresh, you know, into my mind. Um, but I think we should maybe just open it up, you know, for questions or thoughts, if anyone wants to share. I mean, I can talk about this all night, but you probably don't just want to hear me talk. Um, if anyone on the panel has anything immediately they'd like to say, or so who's going to be the first person here or in our audience to open up the combo? Yes, sir, my Cleveland brother. <laughs> um, um, yeah, you know, there are two people that, and I've only lived here three years, so I can't claim to have survived like so many people have. But um, <clears throat> I've been lucky to meet um, Katie, who started the Little Farm, and Vaughn Montgomery who, as I understand it, started Greater Goods mm -hmm. as a place for people to come for help and support. Do either of you, I mean, I lived on the street where Katie and her husband had the little farm. They had, I think, up to 70 animals in their backyard mm -hmm. that were survivors of the fire. And I, I know they had, they've moved and stuff, but um, do, do you know these people? And the, yeah. uh, I know Vaughn, yeah. Vaughn, well, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think there's a huge piece there, though, about the animals, and Julie speaks to it in the film. There's a few lines in there, but in Ojai, which is sort of such a quasi-rural community, I mean, up where we live on Cesar Road, people are trying to get their horses out, and that was a huge part of this story, is all the animals that were affected. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know those people personally, Pete does, but I think that's pretty common. You know, I always hear, first I always say everyone has their Thomas Fire story, and everyone does, um, but in so many of those stories involve getting animals out as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, to your point, you know, there were a lot of heroes. So many people helping one another, and Trevor was pretty mm -hmm. prominent yeah. up in the Upper Valley, but even down here, as us on the West End in the Miners Oaks area that we're all seeing it heading our way and within minutes it's on that ridge line mm -hmm. and you know we're we're like I said there's like 12 animals we evacuated with and uh, luckily we, we ended up in a place where they didn't mind them <laughs> and we were safe and you know again nothing happened in our neighborhood but you just never know you yeah, know and yeah. the, the animals that you know we can't even imagine the the wildlife that Perish. perished and lost their lives and the resiliency of the environment while we were as a tribal group we we followed the debris cleanup crews all throughout we didn't get in till after like in february i believe where they had already started debris cleanup part of, of what happens with our culture what we've invested in since the mid 70s, early 80s, this cultural resource management. So there are laws now in place where native peoples engage with contracts and going on to areas where there might be impacts to our ceremonial sites, uh, burial sites, and living sites. So we know tribally and personally our land here because we grew up here and we have island connections so we contracted with the federal government with fema to follow the, the cleanup crews so what it did for us and what i saw the re reflection of the fire we didn't really see a lot of um, carnage in, in the terms of uh, the animals which was good <laughs> i actually did a reburial of someone who collected the bones on her property of the fire you know, animals, and we reburied and did a ceremony up in the Matillaha Canyon area. But I saw the plants, and the, the, the nitrogen from the ash and everything was like, the plants were like three times their normal size. So the good part of fire was kind of overshadowed by the devastation that happened. But in the normal times of, of indigenous peoples, fire was uh, a necessity, a tool in which you cleared areas so you could see. 
fire, plants grew as a result of fire, so you had that good abundance. So you can see people coming, the animals come in, and so it was this reciprocal cycle with fire and, and rain and water. So when we, when we see the change and people coming into the landscapes, putting in not only with the, the, all these were all man-made, all these fires, mm -hmm. but in the natural fires, you know, that we've intended purposely tended fires for the purpose of what I just spoke about, to clear areas, to produce more plants. Some plants are fire chasers. And then we live seasonally, so we don't have the luxuries that we do today. That we do today. But just going back to, um, you know, that, uh, just the watching and seeing our, um, our landscape just so devastated by, by this raging uh, fire and then the waters that came afterwards and the floods mm -hmm. and so many people you know just lost everything and and again that one man on this on the scene just start again mm -hmm. <laughs> yes ma'am um i came i never heard of this movie burning all night okay i live here i'm a resident okay i was here through the fire um Fortunately, you know, I wasn't personally affected except for evacuating. But two weeks ago, we had Ron Howard here with a film about the paradise. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why aren't we seeing Burning Ojai? And is is it an HBO? It's an HBO documentary. I mean, do you have to pay for it on HBO? Well, I think you need to be. I'm going to take it up with their PR department that you hadn't heard about it. Um, you know, but yes, it's an HBO film, an HBO Max, so you have to have an HBO subscription HBO to see it. Yeah. yeah, so if you go on HBO and type it in. And so it came out in uh, the October of 2020. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, it's been out there. And, I have and, some vague memory uh, that I heard yeah. about it. But well, it's been seen by millions of people. You know, yeah. I mean, to take some, it, it's been seen by millions of people all Has over the world. Put it in the Ohio Valley News? Um, I, I think a little bit, yeah. I mean, this is. I'm, I'm, we're so happy to be here at the festival yeah. and, and showing it here. Right, right. Um, it's no, great. I think the purpose of the festival yeah. is different. I'm concerned as a resident yeah. that the people here need to relive and revisit uh -huh. what happened. And um, so I know. Mean, well, you get a. We don't need to do that. <laughs> where the traffic was bumper to bumper. Uh -huh. said, no way I'm going to sit here in bumper to bumper mm -hmm. traffic. And what happened in Paradise? Yeah. They oh, of course. That's so scary. Um, we, we, you yeah. know, we went north up the Tello mm -hmm. Highway mm -hmm. and got out of the traffic. But there's no plan here, you know, and that's, mm -hmm. that was what was behind the showing mm -hmm. of this movie. Right. I think um, what I happened think. also is that it um, aired out right when COVID was like big. Um, so they were talking about doing a big event with all locals here, but with COVID, it was just too risky to just like. Um, no. Tell people to let us come and have all from yeah. here. It did. It kind so of that's, in the that's middle kind of, of like why. Also, I think we mm -hmm. we didn't like do yeah. a big thing around it. Yeah. Yeah. You should get three hundred people here. I mean, I I came early because I thought this place was going to be packed. Well, you're our number one PR person now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's set up a mirror in you because I think you're right. <laughs> you're right. Of course. Yeah. But it has been seen by millions of people all over the world, you know? And so I take... It's really, um, you know, when people come from, uh, you know, well, we're from Cleveland, oh, I'm from Cleveland, no, I'm mean from France. And people say, I watched your film and it really clicked for me what it feels like to be in the West in those wildfires. And that's really what this film is for. You know, the people in Ojai, we know, Californians know, but this is a film about climate change that never says the words climate change. That's a very conscious choice. So it's sort of like we're, you know, we're Trojan, horse, Trojan horsing this message, you know, to all of America and the world that this is what it looks like and feels like. And uh, a big thing creatively is, you know, the film doesn't get very wonky on the science. Um, we keep it very much with the people and the community affected, everybody in the film lives within a few mile radius. Um, so th these are just things we, we thought about and how do we, you know, the real impact is changing hearts and minds without preaching at them. And you know, and that comes in the strength of the art 
And that's something I think we accomplished here, and I, it's so gratifying that literally people all over the world, Yanni, who's in the film, he's the Forest Service Ranger, um, who I actually, as I was watching, I was like, he, he would have been a good guy to have here tonight. He's amazing. But he's getting calls from people all, all, all over Israel that they'd seen the film and couldn't believe it. You know, so it is definitely getting out there. I mean, when you talk about millions of people have seen a piece, that's a ton of people. But yes, I do agree. Uh, let's have a, let's get 300 people in a room in Ojai and we'll do this again. Yeah. <laughs> that's actually something that we would definitely consider. And that's part of my reason for doing this and bringing my cares is that this needs to be seen. And we plant the seeds with you all. We spread the word, word of mouth. And, um, and we can make that happen. Ron's, Ron's film was actually less directly related to us. It was, it was thematically related, but this is us. This story that they told is so personal mm -hmm. and, and so important because they all survived it with positive attitude, not depressed. I gotta leave, I gotta bail out. Yeah. It's just a beautiful message. And definitely the title, Our Fire Story, that's entitled, that, that means our, you know, that's the whole thing there, this community's. Uh, story. So, one more in the back before I come back to you, sir. Sure. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of going back to the Chumash control burning um, practices. Do you guys know if in the area and in California in general, they're considering bringing those back? Because I know I'm from Georgia originally, and they do control burnings because that's one of the reasons the fires get so big is because that's not happening. Great question. I'm going to swing that one over to our resident reporting expert on what is our fire mitigation strategy in California now. Yeah. Um, and our, and I, I do think there are controlled burns happening. And uh, Yeah, there are controlled burns that happen. There are, there are what you see like a lot of pile burns that happen where, where debris or uh, materials get put into a pile and burn just on a day where there's not a lot of wind and not, not a lot of fire danger. Um, but across the state now, there are prescribed burn associations that are forming. They're forming um, more or less along like county lines, but also within these uh, districts called resource conservation districts. So we have one called the Ventura River Resource Conservation District, and within that district, um, there are folks that are that are looking at our watershed. They're looking at uh, Ojai as a fire shed and looking at how we can form an association that looks at burning several hundred acres a year in conjunction with what the Forest Service does and what CAL FIRE does on a yearly basis so that we are doing a better job of mimicking what some of those um, those indigenous land practice, management practices were to try to harden our communities and make them a bit safer for fire. So you have defensible space around your home and you have prescribed burning that happens within that wildland urban interface. Um, and that's all, you know, as as this area increases to um, in its aridification and temperature, right? as you guys all know, we're the fastest warming zip code in the contiguous United States. Mm -hmm. So at 2.4 degrees Celsius, we've warmed. We're going to keep warming like that. It's going to keep drying the land out. So in order for us to adapt and, and to meet that aridification that's coming, um, we have to try to like not ignite so many fires, right? Most of the, I think something like 90 or something percent yeah. of the fires that we see in California are their human ignition. Um, in our national forest, we have the lowest incidence of lightning ignited fires um, in the entire western United States. Um, so fires that happen around here, they are generally human ignition. The idea is can we reduce those ignitions but also make our, make our, our homes, make our spaces as, wire, as fireproof as possible and also increase um, the social fabric of our communities, right? Who is the person that you call in your life right now that goes and checks on your house if you're out of town when a fire starts? Who is, like, do you have that person who's maybe like a, like a young, able-bodied person who knows your yard or knows your pets and can go attend to something for you? So, like, really thinking about hardening your home, not just the structure itself, but uh, the social fabric around you, your neighbors, how you, how you coordinate, how you collaborate. I think that's all part of it. But to, to tie it all back together to, to your question about are we going to be burning more acres, uh, yes, and it's coming online. Ventura County has a prescribed burn association that is currently in formation. It's about, it's on the cusp of being approved, and you'll probably start seeing um, acres being blackened, as they say, within the next couple of years, like at, at scale. And there's going to be a pretty robust public outreach and education component that comes with that. Like, sort of the way we watch SpaceX launches now, you'll be able to, you'll be able to kind of watch 
a prescribed burn happening and there'll be someone narrating from the resource conservation district kind of play by play what you're seeing and explain to you what's happening to try to inform the community educate us and really get us familiar with fire again because we're all used to having fire you know when we want it, it can contain you turn the fireplace on you you have a lighter in your hand you have the spark is inside the combustion engine so when fire gets loose um, it's a scary thing for us and we're gonna we have to try to really adjust the way we perceive fire in our relationship with it i just want to add to that quickly that's why it was so important for us to have julie in the film because a lot of this stuff is you know people have known how to handle these things and i think one of the most important lines in the film is when julie says you know the people who lived here their relationship with nature was supreme you know and then right on the tail end of that Lonnie says uh there's so many corollaries in the plant life for our own lives and that's sort of like what i think is the most important little passage and so this knowledge this indigenous knowledge we've had for hundreds thousands of years and it's how do we sort of retrain ourselves on that, Julie? Well, it's true. Let me, real quickly, um, the fires were exacerbated also by what man has brought into our regions that's non-native. Mm -hmm. So up north in Northern California, since all the fires are out there, uh, there are indigenous peoples now that still have that knowledge of, of how they did their burns. And so they're working with Forest Service. And they're do they're now. I remember growing up having the seeing the prescribed burns around here every year. But what has happened since uh, non-native peoples came into North America? I'm sitting in my yard and I'm cutting out the ivy because it's all over the place, right? And I'm going. People call our native plants weeds, and I said no, they're medicine. They're they're food. They're tools. They're ornamentation. They're sacred prayer, you know, the, the, everything was used in multiple ways. And so I'm looking at this ivy and I said, you know what, I shouldn't be yelling at you. I should be yelling at the people who brought you here. It's not your fault. <laughs> so, so I look it up. Do any of you know what English ivy is used for? No. No. Respiratory tea. Oh. In England. So when people came here, they brought, they're not going to leave with this, you know, mystery with them going, I can't leave my favorite, my roses or my medicines, I need those. So they bring them and without understanding consequences. For the Spaniards and the missionaries who came out and planted that mustard, it actually, I just learned this, besides, so now I don't be dissing the non-native plants. They had a purpose where they're from. If you're reading Braiding Sweetgrass, the Creator put plants and people exactly in the earth where they're supposed to be, <laughs> but things change. So mustard drops a chemical that won't allow any other plants to grow around it. That's why you see fields of it. So what happens with these non-invasive plants is that they leave fodder. Our native plants, when they die back, they die completely. So there's nothing there. So now you have all of our water sheds full of arundo which was sucks up the water so there goes our water you have the eucalyptus which one single one will drink almost nearly 900 liters of water a day and you have them all over the mature ones that drink even more cutting them down on santa cruz island within two hours the the little septic area was starting to trickle water into it immediately after cutting these trees down it's middle stewart canyon right over here behind city hall there's puddles of water, there's little pools of water after removing the palms and the eucalyptus. Wow. We need to learn how to restore and, re and replant with our native plants. It, it's the only way that we can feel safer and create for that poor little bear, which amazed me that he lived a month after that fire. Like that, that is such an important point. That oh, was filmed incredible. about a month after yeah. the fire, three weeks-ish. Mm -hmm. So that little bear was sort of dragging himself yeah, down the mountain beautiful. to the sound of water. He was trying to make it to the creek. Yeah. That was up Cesar Canyon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Well, just to build on the um, native um, burning of for control of the plants. Or in, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not saying this right. Yeah. Uh, there's actually a film I just saw last month mm -hmm. called The Inhabitants, mm -hmm. and I saw it at the Maritime Museum in Oxnard. Mm -hmm. And so one of the 
inhabitants of uh, California that was shown. It was up in Northern California. I can't name the tribe or the specific river. I, I don't have it up here. But it was so enlightening to me because even as a schoolgirl, I heard, oh yes, there used to be uh, some burning of the forest. And, and I, I, I couldn't picture it. It's like, well, that sounds kind of crazy. Like, <laughs> light something and it takes off across the forest. But no, they were working in a, in a wooded area, woodland area. Um, and a whole team of people, and they go around it. So it's just a little pass. It wasn't a windy day, and and it was like a, one of the elders would say whether this is a good day for this or not. Um, and that's how it would get scouted. Mm -hmm. And so there'd be these little pathways of fire here and there, and going where it could clear some things out. So then you would get the kind of plant growth, whether it was through the basket making or food supply or whatever, but to actually see it in film, really, it really helped me. It's like, oh yeah, I get it. And yeah. it's a whole community thing, and then after they do it, they have some ceremony or something. Sure. And it was, it was really pretty cool, and, I, and the way the, it, it sounded like the practice was going to be uh, accepted elsewhere, and even what I was reading uh, just this last week about the uh, the right thing, the collaborative. Mm -hmm. There was actually a presentation to Ohio City Council, which I saw online. Um, uh, Ventura, County, Ventura County Wildfire Collaborative. And um, it uses the word holistic in a big long mission statement. But all the words seem to make sense. But they use the word holistic. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. OK, so maybe that means incorporating these kinds of well, techniques. So I heard Mrs. Luboff talk. For, I want to just give Mrs. Luboff a chance. She's told me before the screening that she's wearing the clothes when she evacuated. Well, I know. Hey, <laughs> so hey. that. Because, and what I told Michael was that the next day, which was actually four years, 11 months in one day. Jeez. This was when I had, okay. I had no other clothes well. except for a couple gym clothes. But you also said something else interesting out there. That's very interesting, but you said you're, so the Luboffs are back on the property and rebuilding, you were talking about how you're gonna plant all native plants potentially into the future. So this is something we're thinking about doing and, and acting right now. Right, right. Um, well, our, we have 10 acres and our property was really devastated. In the little clip with, that we're in, you can see our lavender field, but we have a beautiful barranca that has water that runs in it probably about six months of the year if we have regular rain. We lost about 50 mature oak trees, like oh trees gosh. that were like this oh big to this big. Wow. And a lot of our soil was really scorched. And now the ground, the gophers have dug it up and we, we have to do something to repair it because it's a pretty steep, steep slope. And they're just gonna look. Well, I'm sure you guys are incredibly conscious of what to plant and how to redesign it in light of the fire. And when we think about rebuilding or, or being here, you know, especially folks who are rebuilding or lost their homes, it's, well, how do we fireproof this, you know, in a way that we can feel relatively safe? Well, I could speak to that. Please Because do. we had a hundred year old craftsman style house. Oh. It was, it was made of redwood. We had completely redone it about two years oh, before. So we fireproofed it, no we did this. endless fire oh, weed shit. abatement, Sorry. Um, but it didn't help. So our new house, our old house was so charming, it was like grandma's house. Mm -hmm. um, our new house is concrete, stucco, mm -hmm. steel roof, mm -hmm. and it's almost the complete opposite. But we, we did a lot of research and that's what would survive the best. Yeah. Well, there is something to say right here and right now that we may not love to hear, but this is a fire corridor, mm -hmm. you know? And a lot of time, if you want to live in a paradise, there's a little, you got to ante up a little bit, you know? And I think um, that's something that's not just here. It's if you want to live on Folly Beach in South Carolina or in Miami or any of these places that are on the metaphorical urban wildland interface. And it's not just a fire interface, it's a flood interface, a hurricane interface. Yeah. And as we saw tragically in Texas yesterday, a tornado interface. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I say that, you know, because there are other places that are dangerous too, and I don't want to leave Ojai. Yeah. So um, as many of us were doing that, taking that sort of calculated risk. Um, but he the environment. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sorry, about three years ago, I saw a film about the Thomas Fire. Mm -hmm. And it was shown in conjunction with, uh, I know there were four books that Liz Rose and another woman published. Uh, Into the Fire? Story. Into the Fire? Into the Fire, yeah, with individual stories and yes. photographs. But there was a film shown at that, and I don't know what happened to it, or do you know about it? Because um, I mean, like a half hour film. No, I, I mean, there's been a number of films made about the Thomas Fire. Um, sort of kept, I, I don't know them all intimately. Okay. I've kept track of them. There's been a number of films made, though. Well, congratulations to you on getting it out there through HBO. Thanks, yeah. 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 Um, and the other, my other question is did they ever figure out who or who started the fire? Well, both stars were power lines. Is that correct? They were what? Yeah. Power lines. Yeah, electric, electrical. Um, the one that was in Omloff Canyon, which is down by the college, if, you, if you're driving towards Santa Paula, a little past, about a mile past right. the college, towards Santa Paula, that was a power line in the high winds. Remember, it was really blowing, really yeah. blowing. Yeah. You know, yeah, I remember being on the roof hanging Christmas lights and being like, what's going on here? <coughs> but sort of like happy-go-lucky, we're just moving in. I'm doing my family Christmas lights, you know, for the first time as an adult. And then, uh, I, I believe that's that's still the longest um, Santa Ana wind event, like a sustained Santa wind event in mm -hmm. recorded history. Really? Yeah. 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 It blew like for six, two weeks. Remember, it was blowing for two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I think six days straight where it was 30, 30 miles an hour or above, wow. just consistently. Yeah. Yeah. And that's sort of, you know, the between the lines, there are, there's some unprecedented things happening here, which is climate change, you know, that these winds are blowing harder, longer, you know, later into the season um, that cause something like this to happen. It's drier, you know, the droughts are longer. Um, and we well, don't they mentioned the thousand year floods too, which that's where we're at right now yeah. in this climate. Yeah. I mean, it's nothing new. It's just that we didn't help it. Yeah. We're making it worse by, you know, the build of materials were 40% uh, of the carbon emissions come from the high rises in LA mm. alone. Mm. I mean, so what we moved away from of that Redwood home, yes. mm. you know, what we're putting out there in the atmosphere right now. So to think about wants versus needs and to reuse and to the very thread, you know, because we're consuming too quickly with everything mm -hmm. and uh, not paying attention. You know, just being, being so close to Ojai and growing up here, uh, we have a uh, connection to this land that, like right here, we are sitting in a anywhere between a five to nine thousand year old occupation other sites like in the upper valley um, are ten thousand years old so you know these people where you're living uh cesar cesar yeah, and i gotta get you up there because they're putting an avocado field in there and i feel I like there's gotta be you know, there's, yeah. there's artifacts up there yes there are i found the bowl up there yeah. yeah there's a rock yeah. called holy rock yeah so you, and ag is exempt from mitigation oh it is <laughs> So I'm hoping that if they do find something, they'll stop uh -huh. and call us. Mm -hmm. But I can't just go in there and tell them to stop. He's, he's stripped the land. That's a whole yeah. other story. That's a whole other yeah. panel. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. so that's, you know, again, it's, it's, I've seen the karmic, you know, result of people desecrating sites and knowing they're doing it. I receive artifacts from people who dig in graves and sell things online and they're world is spiraling around as they're spinning out of control and losing their minds and I said you know once you hand it back your life will change mm -hmm. and immediately it does and when I encounter them there's like a deer in the headlights I said I'm not going to acknowledge you I'm just going to keep walking mm -hmm. but you know again there's there's energy that when you're indigenous and you live in a place and you know and you're learning it and it happens to you and it's being told to you you see the re reflections and reactions of people who want to understand and they should understand. I don't want you to be Chumash, but I want you to feel that indigenous uh, genetic intonations that come through you and out of you through the bloodlines. 
because it's all the same. We all lived off the earth, we all lived with it, and we, we burned by fire. I mean, we weren't all, there's a wonderful book, Tending the Wild, Kat Anderson, where she addresses mostly the people up north about fire management, and where there are times when, yeah, we made mistakes too, and yeah, we got burnt, and things happened, it, got, it did get out of control. But for the most times, uh, prayer was ultimately our painted caves. People would go in there and pray for rain, but what we're doing is we're observing. There are people who have that knowledge of observing the seasons right now. 2004, the whole valley, not quite like it is, twice as much as what it is right now with all the acorns. Mm -hmm. It was loaded and they were nearly four inches big. Mm -hmm. They were gigantic. And I said to my cousin as I'm gathering them, people going, oh, I saw you sweep in your driveway. Oh, that's not my driveway. <laughs> that's like cleaning people's yards for them. And 2005, what is our average rain is 17 inches here. 76, 74 inches that year in 2005. So I'm watching it right now. I've been watching it. I don't write things down, but somebody confirmed my my observant said, you've been right eight years in a row. Oh, yes. <laughs> so I'm looking at them today. We've got a lot of the valley oaks that are dropping big acorns. Mm -hmm. The live oaks, they're plentiful, but they're small, so we're going to have cold, we'll have snow, okay. as well as some rain. And the snow is good because it's going to fill the aquifers. Okay. So when people are acknowledging that, and they're painting in these caves, they're taking the Momoi, the Jemson, and they're, and they're calling out to find out these answers and messages. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not. But these areas of sacredness are that communication, it is that relationship that we've moved away from as indigenous peoples. And knowing that, oh yeah, we can just pick up our phone and call, you know, and Amazon and order our stuff. <laughs> You know, we didn't have those luxuries. We really had to pay attention. And we really have lost that of paying attention mm -hmm. to our surroundings. And for who else is like the, the native uh, community right now. People still aren't aware and they lost their duck. A coyote ate their duck because they're starving. Mm -hmm. There's no water. There's no food. There's, we have to put the native plants back so we can get the bugs and everything. I mean, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. And so Absolutely. until we can learn to keep our animals in and watch what we're doing, mm -hmm. and you know, again, just realize that we're in a very, very you know, vulnerable place mm -hmm. as, as humans. And it's also, though, Ojai is a great place as a case study because it is sort of contained. Mm -hmm. So there can be a success story here. Yeah. where some of these uh, practices are implemented because it's a town of only 7,000 people. It could be a great example, you know, for the rest of the country. And, and I think we can, it is We can do ways. it. We can yeah. set the example. We can yeah. be the example. So I didn't hear anyone mention anything about air quality, but I'm wondering how long did it take before you could feel good know. breathing? And I mean, some people, you lose your house, but then yeah. your health Well, they all let, no, let me speak to that, because she was super conscious of it with our baby. She was a new mother. This little one was only two months old. You want to say hi? <laughs> <laughs> so no, I mean, was a new mother uh, dealing with all this. So you can speak a little bit about that. I mean, um, she was born prematurely, too, so I was extremely um, cautious of like, her lungs. Um, I stayed out of the house for, I would say, a month and a half. Um, when I was coming back, I would still smell the fire. Um, the air quality was still questionable. Um, I think it took like almost, it would say like three months to just yeah, like, like, we had like our, yeah. my in came mm -hmm. and like still mm -hmm. smelled it, like yeah. you just get used to it, but yeah, yeah I think. I have um, a question. Uh, oh, hold on, baby, raise your hand, raise your hand, you yeah, can go so nice. It, it, it took a while. It took a time. Anything else? There's one to that, too, that the asphaltium for a long time was already. That stayed yeah. on fire. Oh, yes, yeah, the did. oil seeps mm -hmm. didn't yeah. go out. Yeah. Pete might be able to yeah. speak to this, but there's been a lot of reporting lately about just how bad the fire smoke pollutants are for people. Um, very serious, uh, these sort of orange hazes we get from the fire smoke. Um, there's been quite, it's, I think it's a real problem, actually, you know, for California. I think they, there's even like PTSD, like around that smell, that oh, you know, the so yeah. fire smell. Every time sure. someone does the fire around you, you feel like yeah. you're gonna call um, I the smell fire today. You know, it's it's really yeah. a, a smell that stay with you um, in some ways. So yeah. 
I think they were doing some burns today deep in our neighborhood because I could smell it and I'm thinking, you know, they must be burning today because it's going to rain tomorrow. Oh, very patiently. Go ahead. Yes. And how would the fire come from the heat? It creates a lot of heat and comes from a lot of heat. That's right. That's how it came. This fire came from electricity. And then it caught some plants. Yeah. Not the natural electricity. Yeah. Man-made electricity. Yeah, well, we're careful with the plugs because they can do a spark. Good question, Mike. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to comment on the air quality because you were in Upper Ohio. Mm -hmm. Those of us who live down here, they, the, uh, I had a neighbor that was a fireman, and he said this was a donut, and we mm -hmm. were living in the hole. Mm -hmm. So oh. down in the valley, we sat. Yeah. It, it didn't, you know, that smoke sat yeah. down here in the donut hole for a long mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And you could see it, you know, like on your windowsill. You leave the uh, windows yeah. open and, you know, for months, mm -hmm. you were still getting black dust. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Ashes Absolutely. were constantly mm -hmm. blowing around. Right. Yeah. We had oak trees that were still burning a month later uh -huh. after big rain. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, they things were, were just still. Yeah, they were just yeah. uh, came from months. Yeah, I'm making some storage notes here. I'm still finding ash. Yeah. Like when I was unpacking. Wow. In, in Upper Ohio, the, the, the tar seeps that Mike mentioned, they, it, it covers like a vast amount of acreage, and including the back few acres of the land that I live on. Um, and so it, it burned for weeks on end, just black putrid smoke that would rise up in Upper Ohio and just settle to the lowest point. So it would come down to the lower valley and settle on the valley floor. Um, if you look at the list of the top, top of the top wildfires in California, Thomas Fire, which was five years ago, this December fourth, um, is about to fall out of the top ten. I think it's at to that either number nine, or number ten of the, of the largest fires. So we've had just in the past five years, the, um, fire, fires that have just been va vastly outsized Thomas and made it made it look quite small. Um, and in the process of doing that. The air quality in, in places, I think, has, is, has really been the thing that has uh, impacted people. Like a lot of these fires, the smoke was blowing west, and San Francisco was for weeks just covered in smoke. Mm -hmm. Sacramento and the San Joaquin Valley filled with smoke. I think the, everyone feeling these impacts in these past five years have really gotten us to this place where we're at now, where all of a sudden the state of California is investing $54 billion in climate resilience and, re and related initiatives, right? Um, all of a sudden, the county, like the county, we have an influx of money coming in now for these prescribed burn associations, for creating solid egress plans in Ohio, for creating uh, ember modeling and mapping for the Ohio Valley, so you can figure out where embers blow in certain in certain wind conditions and certain fire placements. So you can help people to figure out how to how to harden their homes, and so all this is becoming available as a result, I think, of some of the consequences that we've collectively suffered, and I've realized and said, okay, yeah, we want to invest in in making ourselves more resilient to these impacts. So I, that, that's, so I, I feel personally very optimistic about life in Ohio, living here, life in California, and the direction that we're headed collectively. It's, it all is kind of coming together it, right now, it seems like. Last question I promised for me. Um, is what you're saying shared in our educational schools in Ohio? He's a teacher. I'm a, public, I'm a public school teacher, yeah. yeah. What school? Nordoff. Good for you. Good yeah. for them. Yeah. We love teachers. This is Lou Boston teacher too. Yeah. I mean, all the schools should have. I, I can just speak to that too. Mm -hmm. um, I did a summer camp up in Santa Inez at Camp Whittier, and they had a fire ecology program, which a lot of the material is statewide okay. for, mm -hmm. for Teaching fire ecology, at least at the special programs, I'm not sure about the like, public school systems, but it's great because these children are learning the speech to her question too. Is, well, it can, like, spark, fires can spark from all of the non-native plants and all of this, you know, debris caused. It can, especially with the high heats, it can actually spark within that, even if it's not man-made. Yeah. And, and with the air quality, and Julie might know more about this, I mean, um, like if it's a controlled burn and if it's native plants like mugwort and other things, 
it actually is, can be helpful mm -hmm. for our lungs, but all the materials that mm -hmm. we're bringing in and the houses and all that, those materials are terrible for our lungs. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, panelists with final mm -hmm. thoughts or anyone in the audience? Is there a celebration December 4th? Or, I mean, a gratitude type of um, celebration that would come to I don't know. I think, um, I don't know if there is or not. There may be. I think every year on the anniversary, there's a little picnic up in Upper Ohio at the school at Summit. Um, yeah. Hasn't been announced, but I believe we're having okay. a five year. Okay. On December yeah. 3rd. And it, it's amazing to think that five years has passed, you know, since this, because wow, does time fly, but you watch it, it still feels pretty uh, recent, doesn't it? Is that just me? You know, it still feels right at the... Oh, that was painful. Yeah. Right? It's intense, you know, it's intense. So when, and so to get it back to the film, and let, let's end it on this, you know, the point of documentaries and films and art is, you know, this is a time capsule, and this was something really important that happened in our community, that there's tons that can be learned from it, whether it's this wonky reportage or I think the even bigger thing of the emotional impact and sharing that with people that's why we make these intense films you know so we can store these moments and learn from them um, but it definitely is intense and you get goosebumps um, but it's something we live through together as a community makes us closer and uh, so we like to focus on the good stuff you know it's all you can do right, that's right. Um, well, and I love that it, and it can inspire these discussions it can yeah. inspire people to ask yeah. these questions and last thing about the film is we tried to get that magic in there. You know, one of the big challenges of this film was, Ojai is a special place. And how do we get that magic in there? And I think we did, not to do my own horn, but I, I think we did get that in there. And that's really important to strike that balance. Um, so yeah, we're, we're happy to be here in Ojai and we're thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. I just want to add that yeah, I think it's a compliment to the community and especially to you, to the five of you and the two of you, for the passion and the emotion that you brought to this story. And the fact that HBO recognized that, yeah. whether we know it or not, yeah. they can see that this story deserves an audience. Yeah. And we are proud to be promoting this and would love to do a bigger event with more planning, more collaboration, perhaps with other entities, but let's go over to Matilla High and get 350 sure. people. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah. We can do that yeah. December-ish. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe around the anniversary. Yeah, it's nice because it's a quick film. And just to Sven's point, eight, there have been a number of fire films from Ron Howard to XYZ. But what HBO recognized it in this is it is such an intimate community film. You know, that's what makes this one special. Again, everyone in that film lives within a few miles of each other, and that's what HBO recognized, right. uh, just as Sven just stated. So that's something we're proud of. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to add one other thing, too, and that is that the community was absolutely incredible. That magical place that we all live in. We felt so supported by everybody from my sweet little school to all of the Upper Ohio community and people down here that could only say, tell us our story, but well, but we were lucky, they'd say. But we just, people gave us clothes and tried to feed us and toothbrushes, and but just the love and support. Oh, somebody needs a blue rug. I think I have one. That sort of thing, it was incredible. A number of lifelong friendships. Absolutely. Including for me right here at this Absolutely. table. You know. um, so that was the biggest wonderful thing that came from it. Yeah. And the last thing I'll say is that we have attempted to record this in our little beta testing okay. stage here. It will be available if you approve, um, approve. online um, during our streaming period and beyond on our website. And I'm seriously interested in promoting a bigger event, a, a more more knowledge of this, this story. Yeah, we'll get the Fire Safe Council involved. We'll make a whole event, yeah. like, you know, community education involvement event. Yeah. Pete's the MC. Yeah. 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 Yeah.